Many know the name Snorri Sturluson as the Icelandic poet or skald behind the Prose Edda and others, a piece of literature that gave us many Norse myths in written form that have survived down the ages and the cheat sheet that J.R.R. Tolkien stole from. But Snorri should be more famous for being one of the most fascinating men to have ever lived. How Netflix haven't commissioned a series based off of his life, I'll never know. Some of you may have caught the first part of this, but I decided to combine it into one big video and take part one down. There's a timestamp in the comments to skip to the bits I hadn't previously covered. I will butcher the pronunciation of names. I did try to learn how to say them, but frankly, I was just making things worse. So I'll stick with the anglicised versions like the uneducated dolt I am. A lot of what we know about Snorri's life comes from his nephew, Sterler Thordson. Fair warning, there's going to be a few people called Sterler in this video. Stirler did not like him. We'll cover why in the next part, so there is some bias to all this. But enough preamble. Let's get cracking. Snorri was born in 1179 to Stirler. See, there's another one already. A chief who was growing in popularity. He had two older brothers, two sisters, and nine half-siblings. Iceland was, at the time, a particularly litigious society, and in some legal wrangling, Snorri was placed into foster care with one of the most powerful politicians in all of Iceland, John Loftson. John had a school that trained clergymen. Iceland became Christian in the year 999, but rounded up to the year 1000 because they thought it sounded cooler. But Snorri didn't go down that route. He was educated there, though, where he fell in love with poetry. Poetry would be an odd choice for me, but whilst the Icelandic people were certainly violent, their love of poetry was famous. It was how they remembered history, spread news and gossip, and was arguably their most important export until Bjork. They even used it as an early forerunner to rap battles which will come up in a bit. His elder brother, Sigvata, married into a chief position, and when Snorri's father died not long after he was fostered, his eldest brother Thor took the family chief role. Snorri's mother then wasted Snorri's third of his inheritance. History doesn't say what on, so I'm guessing she collected Warhammer, the game, not the weapons, which means that by the time Snorri came of age, he was penniless, but did have a good collection of plastic soldiers. So he did what any good son out of the line of succession did. He married into wealth, specifically to Herdes. She came with a sizable inheritance and, when her father died a few years later, the chieftainship that Snorri so desperately craved. If this sounds rather mercenary, well, it was. There's a good chance that Snorri didn't meet his wife until the day of the wedding, or as a sign of a healthy marriage, and it gave him the wealth and power he hungered for. But to be fair to him, a lot of marriages in Iceland were like that to the point that the church was getting rather fed up with Iceland's lack of morals, which has to be saying something if you know anything of the church at the time. Remember, this is pre-Reformation, so the church was up to all sorts of shenanigans. John, Snorri's foster father, had a wife and two mistresses, including the sister of a bishop. Divorce was rife, and mistresses were commonplace all over. Snorri was to be no exception. He had at least four mistresses in his lifetime and a large amount of children, which will be important. He estranged from his wife in 1206 and set up with another mistress, who again came with a chief position for him to add to his existing one. Was Snorri content with two levels of being a chief? No. He was playing Game of Thrones, though there wasn't a throne at this point but maybe he could get one. So before being elected as law speaker in the Icelandic Althing in 1215, the only position in an otherwise open plan parliament of chiefs, he managed to get whole or part of a total of six chieftainships. He was, to all intents and purposes, the leading man in Iceland. Powerful and rich. Was this enough? Not on your Nelly. Iceland has had the tradition of going to Norway and gaining a minor title or two from the Norwegian kings, then coming back. Snorri was a renowned poet and fancied the title of Royal Skald, so set off to Norway in 1218. He stayed with the Duke Skaldi for a bit, went to the wedding of King Hakon, then 14, and the Duke's daughter. He was then knighted by the King at the same time Skaldi was made an Earl. A knighthood wasn't what Snorri wanted, but travelled with the King for a bit before asking leave to return to Iceland. This caught the King's attention in a way that Snorri's poetry hadn't, because what 14-year-old boy wants to listen to complicated poetry? Aside from that emo phase I'll never understand. While Snorri was away, his foster nephew, Pal, had travelled to Norway, got into some arguments over potential royal lineage, and then travelled back to Iceland. On the way home, his ship sank, which was a shame for him, what with now being dead. It was also a shame for his dad, Shamund, who set about blaming the Norwegians for trying to kill his son. So he marched a small army on a trading post and charged the traders with conspiracy to make his son sleep with their fishes. He accepted a financial settlement from them, told you Iceland was litigious, and you thought America was bad but then continued and find another trading ship and stole a bunch of cargo. Shaman's brother, Orm, took pity on these traders and took them in for the winter, and also paid above odds for some timber. So when he went to get the timber in the spring, the traders did what any good house guest would do, and killed Orm and his son-in-law. Snorri only found all this out when he went to leave for Iceland, and discovered that the now Earl Schooley was to lead a force to attack Iceland in retaliation, for these and other wrongdoings. So Snorri did the deal. He would convince Iceland to turn to King Hakon for protection, whatever he meant by that, Probably not that the king would hand out prophylactics to the Icelanders. In return, the earl would not attack. 
King Hakon agreed and made Snorri a baron for good measure, the first Icelander to have such a high title, which I'm sure would have been good for Snorri's ego. Before he left, Snorri composed a quick praise poem to the Earl, who was so impressed by the lyrical butt-kissing that he gave Snorri the ship he was on, and a bunch of other amazing gifts. Unfortunately, Snorri was obviously the type of person who doesn't cherish his gifts, as he managed to destroy the ship as he returned home, though he made it back alive and in one piece. Coming onto the shores of Iceland, wet, cold and bedraggled, would he receive the welcome of a hero for saving Iceland from attack and probable capture by Norway, or would he be beset by enemies convinced he was due to hand over Iceland to the king? As you may have guessed, people were distrustful. They wondered what Snorri had done to gain his new title. Had he been given it because he was to hand Iceland over to Norway? Was he given Iceland as his personal fiefdom? Was he here as a CIA operative looking for oil? Rather boringly, he set about rebuilding his home to make it more impressive, like those he had seen in Norway, and gathered about him a royal court. Unfortunately, when building, he cared more about comfort than he did security. If I was a good storyteller, then I would gently call attention to this being foreshadowing. But I'm not, so I'll just say... Foreshadowing. In a voice that will get the point across. His royal court was essentially getting the clever bods from around Iceland to come to write and translate books and debate nerd culture, which meant the Christian god, the Norse gods, and the history of the Norse people. Rather like nerd culture today then. Would Thor beat Wonder Woman? Would Superman beat the Hulk? And so on and so forth. It has been suggested that this was a way to create a unifying mythos and a history that would make it easier to join Norway. Essentially saying, see, we're the same, but I'm reluctant to go that far. My feeling is that Snorri was just a history nerd. A power-hungry nerd, definitely. But just a nerd all the same. As a history nerd myself, I can appreciate that. In 1221, he was elected law speaker again, which was the same year his mother died. When she died, everyone sat around grieving for months. Not really. Sigvata grabbed the woodlands of the farm as his inheritance, having got there first. Snorri got there next and grabbed her possessions such as jewellery and her theoretical Warhammer collection. This left Thord grumpy, as there wasn't much left for him, and later would be why Stola Thordson hated Snorri, as he felt cheated of his inheritance from his grandmother. Presumably, he also really wanted to play Warhammer. More interestingly, Snorri did start to develop a power base. Remember how I said he had a bunch of children, both legitimate and illegitimate? They suddenly become important, as they were reaching the age he could marry them off. Which he did with gusto. He married daughters off to enemies to bring them to his side, to allies to shore up political allegiances, basically to anyone that would benefit him. He was such a romantic, in the same way that George R. R. Martin is against violence in stories. Some more foreshadowing with the names of these husbands before we get to the bloodthirsty bits. I hope you're paying close attention. He had married his daughter Halbera off to Arnie the Quarrelsome, which is obviously the name you want for a son-in-law, just before he left for Norway. By the time he returned, they had separated, so he married her off again, to Colbane the Young. Ingebjorg was to marry Gissa, the son of Snorri's enemy Thorvald, and as part of the deal he would get Thorvald's ward, the uber-rich widow Halveig, as his partner. Funny how Snorri always ended up with partners that brought a lot to the table. His other daughter, Thordis, was married off to another Thorvald, again a former enemy who seemingly pledged himself to Snorri. From him came control over the West Fjords. He was a thug of an old man, who had become chief by burning down the house of the old chief, with the chief still inside. A horrible event I'm sure we won't hear any more about. Again, there was a suspicion that he was doing all this to get Iceland under his sway, to hand over to Norway. I'm doubtful, because at one point he had effective control of three quarters of Iceland, and we never saw Norway pop over for a friendly game of annex in the country. I find it more likely that he was just a greedy bugger, but one that was also trying to counter the political power of his nemesis, his nephew, another Stirler, elder son of his brother Sigvata. Stiller had been given the family chieftainship when he got married. Thord, who had the most right to it, didn't care. But Snorri did. So he pulled some political wranglings and Thord again got control of it and passed two-thirds to Snorri. This pissed Stirler off, which was to be a bad move. Given how he was to become known as Stirler Battlestrong, you can imagine how this will turn out. Stiller had quickly risen up in the estimation of the people in Iceland, oddly enough helped by attacking an island where a bishop, Gudmund the Good, had gone into hiding, killing many innocent poor people. It's amazing what will get you into power. He was the main roadblock to Snorri having complete control of Iceland. Now, things are about to get a bit more bloodthirsty. First, we have something of a war by proxy. Remember how I said Thorvald had killed the old chief by burning down his house to get his chieftainship? Well, I was wrong. We definitely hadn't heard the end of it. Thorvald had previously managed to escape his own burning down house, which had been done in retaliation by the nephews of the old chief, Havan. He did this by dressing as a woman and running from the house whilst it was on fire, so that his attackers would just let him go, thinking he was a woman. How very Viking of him. This time it was Havan's son's turn. They had become friends with Stirla Battlestrong and handed to him some chief positions, which they had gained from their father. 
They had not forgotten their hatred of Thorvald. It'd been rather hard to forget your dad being burnt alive, and in 1228 decided to attack. How should they avenge the burn of their father's home with him inside? By doing the same to Thorvald, of course. He died in the blaze, but the attackers did manage to save Snorri's daughter Thordis and their one-year-old son. She, quite sensibly, had enough of all of this and moved as far west as she could to keep away from her father's politics. She didn't want her house to get burned down again. But like any good revenge story, we now move to the revenge for the revenge part. Sterner had offered compensation to Thorvald's sons, but they refused. Instead, they decided to burn down Stirler's home with him in it. Fire insurance rates must have been through the roof. They gathered a group of young men, mostly teenagers it would seem, and rode to Stirler's farm. Unfortunately for them, Stirler had heard of the plan and legged it, but it didn't stop them ransacking and burning the house, killing servants and even a priest, and generally being the sort of teenagers your mother warned you not to hang around with. This prompted battle, but not just any battle, a rap battle. In the former Skaldic poem, Snorri was trading verbal blows with two poets, both called Gudmund, with strong ties to Stirler. Stirler even joined in himself on occasion, although he wasn't as accomplished at spitting fire. The upshot of the rap battle was that people started doubting Snorri's power, realising that he had boys attacking his enemies by proxy, refusing to stand and fight for his own honour. This was where things started to go wrong for Snorri. In 1229, his son, John Trout, wanted to get married and needed Snorri to put up a landholding for his marriage price, a tradition in Iceland. Because Snorri was a tightbagger, he tried to shortchange him with a lesser holding. Why dilute his power? So John left in a huff for Norway. At the same time, Corbain the Young left Halbera, weakening Snorri's power in the north. Stirler, meanwhile, was not backing off. He attacked the sons of Thorvald's home and, when finding they weren't there, he did the unthinkable. That's right, he didn't burn down the house. Instead, he stalked them around the country and captured them, where he demanded payment to end their feud. So, of course, they paid. A brief interlude followed, but in 1231, Halbera died of illness and John Trout was killed in a drunken brawl in Norway. Snorri's son-in-law, Gisser, brought him the news. He was to be present at the death of two generations of Snorri's family, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. This was the same year that a volcano erupted, because even the island wanted in on some of that hot, burning homes down action. The issues from the volcano lay mostly on Snorri's land, though. So, with the volcano blazing and his children dying or abandoning him, what did Snorri do? He held a huge Christmas party, of course. In it, he pushed for peace between him and Stirler, and between Stirler and the sons of Thorvald. Stirler agreed, giving permission for the sons to ride through his lands. If you think this was Snorri being tired of it all and looking to step back from power, that's a big nope. He was trying to get Stirler on side to sue Corbain the Young for Halbera's inheritance. But Stirler was a man of his word. As long as his word is, kill things. Snorri sent his illegitimate son, Areka, to go get the two sons of Thorvald to be married to Halveig's daughters. But they didn't arrive for Areka. Instead, they made their own way south, through Stirler's lands. Stirler was waiting and ambushed them, pelting them with rocks and then executing the two eldest by decapitation. Snorri did nothing. He needed his nephew's support to sue Colbane, which he did, and got half of Colbane's chieftainships and a pledge to support him at all our things going forward. Which he definitely does. Honestly, no questions asked. For the rest of... Nah, he doesn't. But that bit doesn't come until the end. Colbane was to marry his sister to Snorri's illegitimate son, Areka. Snorri was to give the couple a specified estate. Of course, Snorri isn't one to learn from his mistakes, so, after the wedding in 1232, he refused to give it to them, offering a lesser holding instead. Areka wasn't John Trout, though. He wasn't going to sail meekly off into the sunset of Norway. Instead, he went full Viking berserker. He went to his new holding, gathered up every man he could, and went out on a rampage. He robbed and plundered his new lands, then headed south, and started raiding the lands of his uncle, Thord. At this point, Scylla had been summoned to Rome to answer for his previous attack on Gudmund the Good, so Eric had decided to raid Stirler's lands as well, all the while looting, pillaging, and generally personifying the inaccurate cliché of a Viking we know so well today. And, of course, burning down houses, including killing and burning the House of Odd, the lover of his half-sister Thordis, who, if you remember, had previously lost her husband at home to a fire. Iceland doesn't really need volcanoes to spend most of its time on fire. Did that finish things? Nope. Areka then joined forces with Corbain the Young and attacked his uncle Sigvart's lands, who promptly gathered an army to square off with them. Areka calmed down in the face of an army, but Corbain hadn't done as much house burning and wasn't happy that he hadn't hit his arsonist quota for the year. Areka headed home anyway, but not without pillaging and robbing more of his uncle Thord's lands. Somehow, in 1233, Sigvart managed to convince Areka to attack Snorri's own home in Raykult. Snorri had been away and rushed home with a group of men to defend his home. 
Eureka, though, knew about the secret door Snorri had put in place for access to his hot tub and broke in. Snorri managed to talk him down by giving Eureka the land he wanted. You might wonder why you would spend all that time renovating a home to include defences and then have an entrance that bypasses all those defences. The answer is simple. It's a hot tub. You don't want to be walking around defences in the freezing cold after you've marinated yourself in a tub for an hour or two. OK, it's not a good answer, but it's what we have to go on. So Eureka goes home. Is that the end of things? Not even slightly. Because in 1235, the one-man wrecking ball Stirler returns back from paying penance in Rome, after popping to Norway on the way home and having a good old chinwag with the king. What did they discuss? We don't know for sure, but I bet good money it involved Iceland becoming part of Norway. King Hakon's saga certainly suggests as much. Stirler promptly joins his father and heads for Snorri's home of Reykholt, accompanied by 1,200 of his closest friends. Snorri, not fancying someone else popping in through the hot tub door with a bunch of armed men, and definitely not fancying a fight, promptly legs it out of there, leaving it in the possession of his brother, Stirler's uncle, Thord. So Stirler then takes possession of it and some other lands, after a stern telling off by Thord. Snorri, meanwhile, begged his son to use his bloodthirst for his side for a change and asked him to raise an army to fight Stirler. Stirler saw this come in and instead offered Eureka peace and some of the lands he'd taken from Snorri. Eureka had seemingly decided that slaying is only fun when the others aren't armed, so he agreed with Stirler. He went to Stirler to iron out the details. If you thought Eureka was cruel though, Stirler is about to put him to shame. Stirler grabs Eureka as soon as he steps foot on the formerly Snorri lands and has him whisked away to a cave. What happens next is a matter of historical debate, but Stirler thought and claimed the following occurred. Stirler Battlestrong orders someone to stab Eureka through the eyes, blinding him, and cuts off one of his balls. All while Stirler watches. He then leaves a guard to stop him escaping. Snorri hears of this and tries raising an army, but before he does, Stirler thoughts and rushes to his cousin's aid. By the time he got there, Eureka was gone. They tracked him down to a church. The guard felt sorry for him and took him for aid. There, Gudmund the Good, the same bishop that Stirler had attacked all those years ago, miraculously healed Eureka's eyes. No mention of a miraculous regrowing of a ball, though. Eureka sensibly legs it for Norway at this point. Now obviously Stirler Thorson is going to make himself sound good here, and it all seems unlikely. But we'll never know for sure and it's a good story, so it'll do for now. Battle was brewing, so between Snorri and one of his cousins, Thorleif, they managed to raise 400 men and march on Stirler. Stirler, however, had heard of Snorri's plans and raised an army of 700. When they were within a reasonable reach of each other, Snorri found this out and wanted to launch a surprise attack. Thorleif disagreed, so Snorri did what Snorri does best when it comes to battles which is to say, he ran away, leaving Thorleif and his men to fight. Thorleif lost and accepted Stirler's suggestion of leaving Iceland, along with several other of Snorri's supporters. Snorri realised they probably had the right idea and immediately sailed to Norway himself, to hide away from Stirler's power and to keep his own balls intact. He again stayed with Earl Schooley. I honestly get Disney-level bad guy vibes from this guy. Schooley was planning rebellion, civil war, against King Hakon. As they plotted and schemed there, Snorri was offered the Earl of Iceland position, once Schooley became king and annexed the island. Snorri, of course, accepted. It was his chance to regain power. Then, some good news came. Stirler Battlestrong was dead. He'd captured Gissa, Snorri's former son-in-law. Gissa was one of the most powerful chiefs in Iceland by this point, and he stood in Stirler's way. However, Corbain the Young, another of Snorri's former son-in-laws, managed to get the jailers to free Gissa. Stirler really didn't have trustworthy guards. Then he and Gissa raised an army and attacked Stirler. In the battle, both Sigvata, Snorri's brother and father to Stirler, and Stirler himself were killed. So Snorri immediately set off for Iceland, but before he could, King Hakon sent orders saying no Icelander was to leave the country. Snorri, being far more practiced at running away than listening to orders, promptly ignored it and returned home to Iceland. Schooley distracted King Hakon by declaring himself king and starting a civil war. Schooley did very well, by which I mean he was killed less than a year later, begging them not to damage his face. Snorri thought himself safe and immediately began creating a new power network of chiefs. It didn't go well. At the outing of 1240, he brought a hundred men with him. But Corbain had had enough of Snorri's bollocks and spent the whole time hunting for him. Snorri spent that time hiding in a church. If we recall, this was the same Corbain that agreed to support Snorri at all future owl things. Never trust a 13th century Icelander, which is the sort of advice that is very useful in the 21st century. I give the best pro tips for modern living. Gissard remained a faithful friend, to someone I'm sure, but certainly not to Snorri. In secret, Gissard had received a message from King Hakon to bring Snorri to him, or kill him. Gissard was now the favourite chief of King Hakon. 
1241, Halvig died, something that Snorri was genuinely upset about. Presumably he'd read about love in a book by this point. It was also to be the cause, or at least the excuse, for his demise. The two sons wanted half their joint lands as inheritance. Snorri, as greedy as ever, refused, offering only the lands that Halvig brought to their partnership in the first place. You'd have thought he would have learned his lesson by now, but no. So the sons went to Gissa. Gissa saw his chance and showed Cobain the letter from King Hakon. In 1242, they marched the combined army on Reikolt again. Would the defences do better this time? Nope, because there's the worst kept secret door again. Not so much as even boarded up. In poured their men, killing anyone they found. Snorri was hiding in a cellar. When he was found, he begged for his life, which went as well as schoolies begging did, as he was killed as he lived, cowering from armed relations who had turned on him because of his greed and lust for power. And so ends the saga of one Snorri Sturluson. There was to be no happy ending for Iceland either, of course, as they ended up agreeing to become part of Norway barely 20 years later. Gissa became the Earl after pushing it through a vote in the Althing. Convoluted, bloodthirsty and very Game of Thrones-esque, Snorri Sturluson may be one of the most interesting men who ever lived. Like if you liked, subscribe if you haven't. There are many more people, myths and battles for us to look at in the near future. Make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss them. I believe the bell is also there for a reason, but I'm beginning to think it may be just decorational.